Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. You are tuned in to the Vitamin D Podcast with your host, Dawn Day. And we're here to get you excited about your life. We want you to feel good, live life on purpose and for a purpose. But as life goes, there are ups and downs. So what happens when life hits you hard? You know, sometimes it's like that continuous flow and then you get that one hit that just feels like it just knocks the wind out of you. Now, I'm not talking about losing your keys, your phone, you can't find your parking spot. I'm talking about those big losses, like a loss of a loved one, a friend, a career, a bad health diagnosis, whatever the case may be. And it seems as though we've talked a lot about loss on the Vitamin D podcast the past few weeks, but I think it's because we're living in a series of crises worldwide. It's causing us to open our eyes and to see what's going on around us. So today I want to focus on the positive that can come out of pain, because while pain is inevitable, suffering isn't. While we will be hurt by major losses in our lives, it doesn't have to rule us out. While we may be hurt by the major losses in our lives, we don't have to be ruled by them. You know, I came across this quote and it goes, if you feel like you're losing everything, remember that trees lose their leaves every year and yet they stand tall and wait for better days to come. Let me say that again. If you feel like you're losing everything, remember that trees lose their leaves every year and yet they stand tall and wait for better days to come. You are going to have to stand tall for better days to come. To that end, I'm talking to a friend, a mentor, a colleague, and to many known as your favorite play cousin from the Steve Harvey Morning Show, Mr. Kid Junior Space. If you don't know, I've almost died seven times. I've almost died. We're going to talk a little bit about his life. Kier has been in the comedy world for over 20 years. He's traveled with the likes of Aretha Franklin, Keith Sweat, and even Steve Harvey. I mean, the list truly goes on and on. But what you may not know from Kier is that in 2018, he found his best friend dead in a hotel room. Kier talks about how he overcame that. He also talks about how Steve Harvey invested in his acorn. I'm telling you, this conversation is riveting. It's going to be a lot of insights. It's going to pull at your heartstrings. But guess what? You are going to walk out feeling excited about your life. So without further ado, it's time for your dose of vitamin D. Get your vitamin D right here with me and get excited about your life. Ta-da! In the flesh. What's happening? What's How you doing? Girl, my head living my best life. I can post. tell. Your future's so bright. Them stunner shades on, boy, stop. I just walked in the house. I just got in the house. I've been out all day looking like this. I've been, I've been, been in the house. I just walked in the house. Got on my laptop. Look at Don Day doing her thing. Girl, I know. Girl, how many studio days I seen you in? Right, right. In all kinds of shapes and forms. You've seen it from yeah. the beginning to right. The first person I saw with a Wakanda tattoo in your mouth. I was like, get out of here. <laughs> now Black Panther gone. Oh my God. Can you believe that? You, you just did it. Wait, you, I'm about to do it. Click. Mm. Yeah, this is, it's in there. And you know what? It says life because I speak okay. life. You know what I'm saying? Speaking life forever, Wakanda, baby. Yeah, Wakanda forever. We just, you know... This goes right in topic because we're talking about Chadwick Boseman and rest in peace to him. But Absolutely. this coincides with that of why you got to live your best life. So let me tell you, <clears throat> vitamin D is a pun off my name. You get vitamin okay. D from the sun. So I shed light into your life. D podcast, I get it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So what we're going to talk about today is just everyday life of what you've been through. And I want people that... Hear you on the radio, watch you on TV, go to your comedy specials to know a little bit about you and be like, oh, Kira did it, so can I. Absolutely. Absolutely. All, all of that is feasible for people. Um, I mean, look at our look at our men, look at our leader, look at our mentor. You know, the conference of men, Mr. Harvey had, or the, the reason why you think about your entire existence, not just your life, but your entire existence. Listen to me, one person who can project you to another position. What? <laughs> I, I, I mean, my whole life that I had been living before him was just to meet this one person who could change the projection of my entire existence. That's what Harvey is. That's what you have to acknowledge. Because not only did he change my lifetime, but, but whatever situations I've been going through and we talk about these things, this is the public part. This is this, 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 not, this is the private part. This is things we talk about that I know I've said to him 
and uh, trying to move through so many different things in life. And see, I didn't have a father like that. I didn't have a friend like that. You know, you know, you was there when when my my friend died. You know, the one I had, then Brian, I just, Brian me, Cook, yeah, rest Brian, in peace. Brian Cook died, and then I had Harvey. And Harvey, well, people don't know when I was at the lowest at that point in time. Mister Harvey called me every day, and he just kept saying words of encouragement, like, "Man, we need you." Man, the show ain't the same without you on it. Wow. Man, we, we and I'm trying to move past the situation. That I was not prepared for. Nobody's prepared to lose their best friend. You ain't prepared for that part. I'm no. telling you. And, and as much as you try to think about it, what it could feel like, it knocked the wind out of you. Yeah, no, it's going. It's going to take everything, man. Because I had never been to a situation like that. You're not prepared for it. What Brian had gave me, and I was talking to somebody earlier about Brian today, actually. But what he what he had gave me was a sense of you belong. Well, you don't get that all the time in this business. Because when I first started telling jokes, Brian was a dude that was there since day one. And then God snatched him. And you're trying to figure out, how do you make it past a situation like this? With everything else you got going on, I just wish I had him back, man. Because he was a sense of base. He gave me a base. He gave me a base about everything. We talked talk about so many different things about how I handle this whole stardom, how do you handle this and that? And he said, man, no, you just got to continue to be in you. But the way he was saying it, different days, we would laugh about all those different things and then that's gone. And you know, I can attest to that because you met him too, you know. Him. It was around when I first started. He always talked so highly of you. And he said how y'all went way back and started in the business. And how he said, he was like, that's my boy. He was like, I believe in my boy. I'm going to stand by my boy no matter what. He's the first fan I ever had. So when your first fan you ever had gets snatched away from you, it's very difficult because when I couldn't see, he had the vision. I couldn't see that far. Cause I was like, yo, dude, I'm tired of this. He's like, hey man, you you can be tired. You can't stop. You, 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 but you cannot stop. But he would say, you can be tired. Talk, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to hold you up even uh, when you be tired. And he would do that. And we and and in the places we have been and the and the 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 when we were doing the things we were doing, and I was trying to make a name for myself. He was there at every stage, at every point. Like when I would come off from opening up for Frankie Beverly and Mays, what? he was inside. He was right there. When I opened up for Keith Sweat, he was right there on the side. When I came off for BB King, he was on the side. When I opened up for Aretha Franklin, he was on the side. Anita Baker, he was right there on the side. That was the dude I would turn to. But he taught me so much about encouragement, which led me to keep going on the mission. And then when we got to the morning show, when I got the news that, that Steve was going to hire me, he was the first person I called and he was the happiest. He was like, what did I tell you? Wow, you had a real cheerleader, somebody that was down for you. I had a cheerleader, but he was like, what did I tell you? <sighs> and then I appreciated him more on that day because there was a day we would talk about, see, I'm saying we drove everywhere. We weren't flying. We was driving across to from from Houston, from Texas to Birmingham, to Virginia, to uh, North Dakota, to Arizona, to uh, New Mexico. We was driving all of these places. So you, you mentioned, so just for those who are unaware, what happened with Brian? How did Brian pass? In Atlanta, um, we had went to Cigar uh, City Club, went to 617 that night, went to dinner, you know, just, you know, because we were living in California and just, just places when I was living here before, we just frequent these spots. We go there and we had uh, a couple cigars. You know, Brian never drank. But we just smoked cigars. He just enjoyed smoking cigars. So I was trying to say, hey, we're going to go here, we're going to smoke here. Never drank anything like that. So we was at 617. It was about 11 o'clock. And I was asking, was he good? I said, man, you good? 
And for some reason, Brian was moving in slow motion. Like everything else was at regular speed. But his head nod was so slow. He was like, yeah. I was like, this ain't normal. There's something going on. Because I'm looking at everything else, man. I was like, why is this dude moving in slow motion? This dude is, what is, what is he doing? And so we get back to the hotel about 12 something. All right, about 12, 15. He on the sixth floor. I'm on the third floor of the W here in Atlanta. And I was like, hey, man, see you in the morning. His last words was, hey, man, don't be late. 12 o'clock, car be here to pick us up, go back to the airport. I was like, dog, when am I ever late? You know, just being me. Just, when am I ever late, dog? I ain't never late. You know, damn well, I'm going to be downstairs at 12 o'clock. He was like, hey, man, just tell you, 12 o'clock. Then he said, I love you, man. I was like, hey, man, love you too. I didn't even know that was going to be the last time we spoke. And then I woke up the next morning and I was downstairs eating breakfast with a friend of mine about a business preposition. We were talking about this. And I just called him. I said, hey, you know, we come down breakfast. Let's eat breakfast because we got to leave. And he never showed up. And then about 12 something, 12 hours later, when they came to me and they said, hey, you might want to come see this. I ain't never ran so fast in my life. And I knew that. I knew what it was. I knew that he was having, I knew he had problems with seizures and stuff. Oh. But I knew this was the one that, so I ran to the room, I rolled him over, and it just was what it was. And it was like, I, I was asking him to get up. I asked him, come on, man, we gotta go. We got a flight to catch. We gotta go. And it was like, we need you to leave the room. I was like, I'm not leaving the room because my best friend did. Y'all leave. I'm not leaving him. And that's when I realized that my first cheerleader was gone. I just realized he was, he was just, he was just gone. You know, it was just one of the things we realized like, hey, for the first time in my life, I never felt so alone. And then, you know, TMZ videos and I just remember from, that. Hated, yeah, I was like, I hated, I hated that part about my life. I hated it because the hardest thing was to call his parents and say, hey, your son's gone. But at the same time, I never gave them any details about what I saw in the room. And I knew somebody in the hotel had sold the story. And I just couldn't believe people could be like that in a very private moment. Extremely private moment. Now, how how long did you stay in there with him? Oh, oh man. It was the longest day of my life. Um, I'm probably only in the room about 15 minutes because they they had to to force me out the room and then I just remember going outside his room just on my knees just bawling but the process for that day for the coroner to come all those types of it was a it was a whole day process it was one of those things like you really are getting the fact that he was going so Mr. Harvey was in Atlanta too at that time he didn't come to the hotel because it would have been a news story because we talked about it He's like, man, I can't come. I said, Harb, I don't want you to come. He said, but I'll send Blue. And Blue came. Uncle Harvey's one of his friends. He came. Blue came and helped me through that whole situation. Because you don't know how to deal with somebody dying. Like, I don't know how to find the body. I don't know about no coroner. Nothing about that. And Blue helped me and assisted me for that whole day because I had to worry about all those different things. You know, I just knew that I, I didn't even get, I didn't even, I don't know how they got the better that I didn't have to see it. This, this thing was just, you don't want to see it. Let alone, you don't even know if you're really there and seeing what you're seeing. What are you hearing? What is everybody talking about? Yeah, everybody was talking, all these different things, you know, and they were saying all these different things and you can hear the conversations. I just was in a corner this one Atlanta police officer sat with me for the whole day. And I can't remember his name, but this officer sat with me for the entire day. He came at 12. He didn't leave until 10 something. Because it, it, it took about 10 hours for us to be over. Um, you know, I had to get Brian's parents. Uh, well, his dad came down and his sister came down because she didn't want her dad to be alone. So I got to make sure everybody got there. I made sure everybody had a hotel room. It, it's one day. It was just a long, long day. 
it's one of the hardest things. But I learned so much during that day about what your tolerance is. Sometimes you have to look at what's the stress level. Like everybody has a stress level. Like you got one level you're at. And so you look at what Brian's thing was like, what's the breaking point? You know, what is your breaking point? Mm. A lot of people don't know what their breaking point is because they have not been put at that level. Well, that day I learned that my my stress level is this far. But my breaking point is this high. I'm way above my stress level because I had to experience something that showed me that how much you really can tolerate. Even as ugly as it is, even as ugly as it is, you know, you know, I, I'm, um, it's not a day go by that I don't think about the first person that I had as a fan and a friend. You know, you know, somebody from friends, you were 16, you know, the ins and outs. So boy, he said, that's my boy. He t- oh, he said, that's, he said, I always got his back. A lot of times when I was on stage, I was playing, I was just performing for him. Cause we was we would be riding in the car writing these jokes and like, dog, watch I'm gonna do this tonight. Watch, watch I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna say what we talked about on this little five hour ride. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it. And he'd be like, say it, say it. And, and it would go just like we planned. You know, it would go just like we planned. And then I just learned so much from that one loss about who I was as a person. It's funny that you can lose something and discover something about yourself. what you say? Say that again. Yeah, yeah, I lost something that was important. But what I learned was in the process was how big of a person I was through the loss. Don't get me wrong. The, the hurt is there. It's still there. It's a daily hurt. But what I found out was I can absolutely respect the fact that he meant that much. And he showed me exactly who I was by the loss, not by why he was here. Because he was just my dude. We was running together. Once after he was gone, then I realized how much he taught me and by how much I was of a person. If I never would have lost him, I never would have realized with love. And so God has a way of giving you something to build up to, and then you lose it, and you can realize that in that loss, oh my gosh, I'm way much stronger than I am. Come on. But one person, it was the it was the one person that gave me the most, and and then you lose that part. Well, we're, we're, we're all gonna have those experiences. That's just what life if is. If you are blessed enough to have a relationship like yours, whoever, whoever you love the most, think about the day they're gonna be gone. It's not. It's not. <laughs> they gone. You gonna be. You gonna be thinking about like what? This is what I loved about this person. This is what I appreciate about this person. This is what this person actually showed me. And then I take everything I did from Brian. I take it and I get to invest it in a new person. Oh. See, now I found somebody else. The lesson that Brian taught me, I get to invest in somebody because I didn't look at everything the way Brian looked at everything. I looked at some stuff, you know, just for just for June. I, just, I was just selfish about some things. What Brian part was, quit being selfish. That was his response. Quit being selfish, dog. This is what you do. This is it. This is it. Hey, man, look at this. I was like, hey, man, you're right. Because when you start this journey out, you selfish because you only had you. Mm, and you started this journey over 20 years ago. Yeah, I started this journey out with just looking for how I can be one thing. That don't go no different for, for, for actors. It don't go no different for, for, for comedians. It don't go to musicians. All of us start this out as a selfish journey. Mm. That's how the journey starts. There ain't nobody to say, hey man, no matter what my family going through, I must do X, Y, and Z. But then you got somebody on the journey with you and they show you that, hey dog, you're busy now that it ain't about you no more. Now it's about X, Y, and Z. And this is how you're going to help other people. This is why you're going to do this thing. This is why you're going to do this. This is why you're going to do that. And that was a constant thing. Found a purpose. That's why I became a better person. Wow. 
because I lost something that told me that it ain't about you no more. Them first five years, about me. I ain't get that how you felt. I ain't get <laughs> so I'm trying to get somewhere. I'm, I'm trying to get out of poverty. <laughs> that's, that's my own. See, when poverty be on your ass, I don't give a damn what you're going through. I want out. I want out. Give me out now. Hey, man, you need to do, you need, you need, you need to do this. Hey, hey, hey. I want out. I don't have no time for nothing else. I'm sick of this. I'm, I was sick of it. I'm sick of sleeping at rest stops. I'm sitting driving 400 miles for $200. I, I did all this. I'm tired. Well, what got you started in doing it? The dream, the vision. You just, you already knew from a little kid, you said, I want to be a comedian. I want to be funny. Like, how did that happen? Uh, I probably had about 14. I was about 14 years old when I knew this is what I was going to be doing. But it's one thing to say, you know what you're going to be doing. What are you going to do what it takes to get there is a whole nother. What you say? I was just talking to Jay about that. It's okay to have a dream, Don. You can have the dream. Come on. You can have it. It's okay to have the dream. I'm telling you, I'm like nobody different. It's okay for God to tap you and show you exactly what you're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. God tapped me at 14, just like this. Hey, that's you. <laughs> Oh, God, that's what I'm doing. Because I love doing that. I love watching this. I was watching Def Comedy Jam. Martin Lawrence on TV. He's like, that's what you're going to be doing. I was like, oh, God, that's great. Oh, wonderful. But what it took to get there. Hey, God, you sure it is me? I don't, you know, um, can we backtrack? Because I think that being uh, this person would be great for me. I think that would be, uh-uh. Mm -hmm. You got to go. You got to continue. You got to continue the path. You got you to you 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 be on it. You got to be on it. Why, why, why I got to be on it? Because you know what? This ain't, I'm tired of sleeping at rest stops. I'm tired of uh, Not sleeping. being in a different place. I'm, I'm, wait a minute. I'm sick of all this stuff because this ain't what I had planned for my life. Lord, I'm only 26. I'm trying to, hey, hey, trust me. It's going to pan out in the end. You just got to keep going. Well, God, the, the keep going part is what you keep going with. I don't really care for the keep going. <laughs> the keep going is tough because I don't have anything to show for it. Come on. All you got is that feeling and that vision to know that it's yours. And nobody can identify with that feeling that you have. But then you, you're talking about, oh, God, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of doing this part. This part, it, it, this is really ugly. God, God leave, man, I'm... Uh, look, God, I'm on I-20 in the middle of uh, 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 Jackson, Mississippi, or you're in, you're in the middle of nowhere. In, in the middle, you having these conversations in the middle of nowhere. You sure? Because uh, I can't see it. But that one little voice said, yeah, just keep going. Just keep going. Yeah, I, I promise you. I promise you. You don't see it today. But he go, but hey, 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 hold on. I'm going down here for $75, though. I'm finna go get $75. I'm finna drive this far. Um, it's the middle of the night. It's two in the morning. I'm at a rest stop. I'm gonna drive this other far, and you telling me it's all right. Yeah, yeah, trust me. It's gonna be, it's gonna be good. Yeah, trust me. You, you can't see it right now, but I'm telling you. Well, this is years of those conversations. God, I'm I'm on I sixty five, ninety five. I'm, I'm on. This, God, I'm just tired. I'm tired. This see, why I just go back and be? No, no, mm -mm. no, no, no. It's not it. You have to go down there because guess what's going to happen? And you, then you start realizing the other part when you get there. Like, guess what happened? You're going to help uh, so many people. <laughs> once I get you to where you're going. But I need you to go through a lot of different things that you're not going to be comfortable with, but the impact you're going to have. And when you get there, you're going to see that I had to have you go through all these different things. So you're tough enough. And then when you get there, watch the thank yous. Yeah, watch the thank yous you're going to get. Watch. And so guess what I get to experience today? Hmm. All of the thank yous. I get all the thank yous, not just for being on the morning show, but the thank yous of, thank you for helping me tell the story about sickle cell. Thank you for being an authentic person. Thank you for reaching out to me. Thank you for helping me with this. Thank you for donating to this. Thank you for that. 
I didn't even know you was going to help me with it. So all of the thank yous. That's why I keep going. I do it for all of the thank yous. I get all the thank yous I get now, Don. I wasn't getting 20 years ago. Because 20 years ago, I was just actually having a kind of, God, I'm so tired of this. This is, come on now. I can't do another rest stop. I got $25. I got to decide between food and gas. Well, um, I ain't got to be over here to this date. I got to do this part. Okay, so if I get... See, that's why I think McDonald's for the dollar menu. I had everything on Come on, on. what you say? No, people don't understand the dollar menu meant a lot. <laughs> I love that, that 99 cent cheeseburger, 99 cent fries, and a 99 cent. So for $3, I'm going to eat. Probably not the healthiest choice, but I'm going to eat. And I'm going to make it to the next destination. I'm going to get to where I got to go. I'm going to do this the best way I can. I did that for years. And then what happens? How did you in, How did you meet Harvey? How in the world? How in the world? This yeah. brother is out on the road, sleeping at rest stops, driving for $75. I mean, maybe that was yeah. a good night. How you get in the room with Mr. Steve Harvey? I met Harvey. For the first time, it's, this, this is what I love about Harvey. Harvey been the same dude. It's 2020. So 18 years ago, I met the same dude. He been the same. I'm telling you something. Harvey been the same cat. Harvey been, <laughs> I'm just laughing because Harvey been the same dude <laughs> that I met. That we get to hear every month, but I met this dude. He was a Richard Kings of Comedy, all that. So he was a comedian, like, you know, like, he was like, yo, <laughs> I, started, I started doing comedy in 99. So three years later, I meet Harvey. So I'm like, oh my God, this dude is like, oh, because I was a fan. Hey, what happened? Are you at the club? What are you at? I've seen the Mike Tyson eye joke. I've seen the Kings of Comedy. You know, I've seen, I, yeah, all of that. I see, and I'm a fan. I first meet Harvey because Rushon McDonald, all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Rushon McDonald from Houston, and he was managing Steve at the time. And Rushon McDonald was having; they were at Steve's company was having a showcase. But because I knew Rushon McDonald, they called me like, "Yo, come down to LA. We're gonna do the showcase." This is what we're doing. We're showing off to NBC, ABC, CBS, WB, young talent. So this, that was the showcase. That was about. Okay. Sound like an upfront or something like that. Yeah, yeah, like something like that. You know, but I don't know all these terms. I'm just, oh, I'm glad they asked. Now, I don't know if I'm going to see Steve. I don't know that. Just oh, trying to come, come down there. Because we were the only group uh, that was me and Al Freeman was the only two people outside of Los Angeles that was coming from Houston to come down there. So I was staying with Rashawn McDonald in his house in L.A. And we go over here to Sherman Oaks to the theater where we were rehearsing at and stuff like that. Like, I didn't even know. I ain't seen Steve. This is, this is um, 2002. I ain't seen Steve yet. One day, Steve came to the rehearsal. He was doing, um, he was just finishing up um, his business on his day job, the radio show, all this type of stuff. I ain't seen that. Man, I go into rehearsal one day and Steve is sitting in there. <laughs> so Steve was so fly then. <laughs> Everybody knew who the hell that was. That's like, it's like, ain't no guessing. That's why I be laughing because at Harv, Harv ain't no guessing. When you walk in the room, you be like, that's Steve Harv. Like, it ain't no, um, that's so and so. No, you say that's. That's Steve Harvey. Mm-hmm. You know, he's sitting there cool. I'm talking about cool. He had on this um, blue silk suit. I don't know, <laughs> silk, but it was shiny. It was like, I was like, this, I did so now I'm a fan again. <laughs> blue cheese at its fine. Oh my, I'm like, oh my God. And he's actually watching the talent. He's, he's not in there for nothing else. He's actually studying to see what the project is, what they're doing. See, he wasn't about him. He was in there trying to help us. So I was watching this dude, I was like, <laughs> but, you know, I was so young then, you know, I got to say, I was like 
22. 22 years old. It was like 20 years old. I was like, but when I walked in, I, said, I was such a fan. I was like, oh. And Steve was so cool. He said, hey, bro. <laughs> That's all just like him. It's all good, bro. Hey, man, just sit down, man. You good. No, no, I ain't good. It's you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Then, if you know, I'm at lunch with Steve. Then you go to lunch? Went to the Rainforest Cafe uh, off of um, Ventura Boulevard. I know exactly LA. what I said. Over, I'm over here having lunch with Steve Hart. I can't believe it. I'm, call, like, I'm on the phone. I'm calling my mom. Now, mom, now I'm not whispering. I'm, he's sitting across from me. Mom, you ain't going to believe I'm sitting there having lunch with who? Steve Harvey. So he hit his name all goddamn day. <laughs> then two hours later, he was getting ready. It was a Wednesday. We were getting ready for him to go do, do the L Ray Theater. He would do the L Ray on Wednesdays for like their their um Showtime the Apollo night. So we go to his um penthouse in Beverly Hills. So in one day, <laughs> I went to lunch with Steve. I saw at rehearsal, and now I'm at the penthouse. In Beverly Hills, overlooking the Pacific Ocean. What? In one day, I'm like, you, God, you got to stop. Sit at the penthouse. He goes back in the back. He got the blue suit, put on this nice little gray suit with the white. He said, hey, uh, hey let's roll. So we go back downstairs. Uh, on, on Steve's floor at the penthouse, this is what I had to note. This is how I, I, I started learning how to dream. There was only four apartments on top of his his building in Beverly Hills. It's only four apartments. They all look out over the over, over the Pacific. I was like, "This is what I, this is how you live." You go jokes. Oh my god! <laughs> you like that? I don't even worry about that. You get back downstairs. This is pre talk show Steve. This is pre LA Steve. This is pre Little Big Shot Steve. This is pre. Steve made them a long ass time. Long time. Man, I've been seeing the dude since. And so he was always in his club. So then he takes me to the El Ray Theater where it's sold out. We're going to the back of the El Ray Theater in LA. Steve walks out on stage, just walking the back door, walking back on stage. And he does this show, like the Apollo, but it was in LA. And he does this show, and this show is like, Two and a half hours, right? But Steve out there killing them. I'm talking about, I'm on the side stage walking. Now, understand, I have no name. Nobody knows me. The question becomes, at that moment, why are you here? Why are you getting to see this? What is, what is, what is, what is your role in this whole process? And you know, I was just thinking, why did he take a liking to you? I don't know. It's not the fact that he took a like it. It's the fact that he showed me. Come on. He just showed me something <laughs> that I had no clue about. So in the middle of clapping and cheering on that, I said, what you doing here? Mm. Out of all the people, out of everybody in this country, why are you this close? Have you ever thought about that part for your own life? Sometimes you be so up close to the fire that you can you forget the ass. Why ain't lit yet? Whoa. First of all, you know what, Kier? Don't be coming out here spitting these gems like that. Because in a minute, I'm going to have to bring out a pen and paper. Why are you hanging around with all these people to fire and you ain't lit yet? Why you ain't lit yet? Ooh. I just had enough sense to know. I had enough sense to know why... I was there. You can recognize. I get it. And guess what? Favor ain't fair. Come on. say Favor ain't fair. Sometimes you are in positions in your life because they, you need to get the lesson. Harvey showed me something. Man, I would, uh, you understand? I was 21 years old. So then when people say, hey, man, where you come from? I've been here the whole time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's funny to be saying, oh my God, Joe, we love you. Where you come from? I've been here the whole time. Mm-hmm. You ain't come out of nowhere. Don, you ain't come out of nowhere. I ain't come out of nowhere. You've been here the whole time. It's just the focus shifted. 
What? That's it. So now you're looking at me and he's like, oh my God. Um, oh my God, we love you, Junior. No, I've been cured the whole time though. What's the difference between Cure Space and Junior? Nothing. <laughs> Ain't nothing. Same dude. Mm. Same dude. Same exact person. Same exact everything. Same exact all that. Ain't, ain't nothing shifted. I've been here the whole time. People talking about, how, how did you Harvey find you? Don't nobody know that me and Harvey met in 2002. Because, mm. you know, I was just listening on the show the other day. He said you're the youngest on the show and the youngest on the show by age and how long you've been on the show. Uh, yeah, exactly. I've been on the show nine years now. But I've been on Harvey. Harvey didn't hire me on the radio show until 2011. I've been doing Harvey since 2002. So what happened in them nine years? What happened in those nine years? You tell me. What did you have to get to deserve that seat? Uh, I went and did comedy. I went and did plays. I went about my career. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, I get a phone call uh, in 2010 to open up for Harvey in Miami, right? So Harvey calls me, his people call me, JT hit me up. Hey, yo, Harvey want to know if you want to open up for him in Miami at the Biscayne with the, with the Marriott connected to it, Biscayne Theater in Miami. I get the phone call, I was like, uh, why is he asking me do I want to work? The obvious answer. <laughs> yeah, but here's my question. Who all said no? Right, that even got to be a question. Yeah, I asked who all said no because y'all reaching way down here to find a cat like me to open up a Harvey in Miami. He got said, DL, Bernie Mac. You think about all these people he can call. Yo, you can't come. What the hell is you reaching back to Houston, Texas for to find me? But okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. So I get to Miami. I see Harvey in Miami. Now I've seen him over the years. We ain't just talk, but I see him. You know who I am. I mean, we have a cordial relationship at this point. Har, what's up? June, what's up with this happening, man? Ain't nothing, man. What's going on with it? Man, no, I love you, man. Love you too, Black Pip. Go to breakfast film. We eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Then we go do the show in the same hotels. Right. About 6.30, I get my stuff together. I go over to the venue. Show started at 8.00. I lit this damn crowd on fire, man. Just set fire, man. Harvey was on the side stage. When I come off stage, he say, man, what the fuck is you saying? <laughs> no, I don't come out of my dressing room for nobody. Wow. What is your ass out here saying? I heard all this noise. I had to come see. I was like, man, we just out here telling Joe Hart. That's all I'm doing. That's it. So I left Miami. Hey man, you want to do Philly? We left Philly. Hey man, you want to do um, Oklahoma City? Hard. Left Oklahoma City. You want to do Dallas? Left Oak Dallas. You want to do Shreveport? Harvey was torn. So he was paying me fifteen dollars a show. So in five weeks, I had made by seven thousand dollars. What? Mind you, this is the same brother that was driving at two o'clock in the morning for seventy five dollars. What you say? And that's why me and Harvey relationship. And you've seen it, you know, your heart relationship is the way it is. And I get a call one day in 2011, in August of 2011, Sean say, this is per Steve Harvey. Uh, Steve Harvey would like to uh, help you with your career. Wow. That's, it wasn't a job. He said, it's with your career. And that's when I knew that in 2010, I was on the road, and in 2011, he gave me a job. And that's how Junior became to be. It's so interesting, and I guess, you know, I just I just get worked up times because I just think about how you just got to live your life and pursue your dream. And to hear you say this, and this is for, you know, if you're listening, go check out this YouTube video where Harvey put up, and he talked about how you got to find somebody to invest in your acorn. Yeah. He invested in your acorn. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'm really, and I was absolutely, that's absolutely true. That was, um, that's actually, I know it was going to be him. So th- this is why it's hard to pigeonhole this man in one way because he do so many things. Because 
because he invested in me, then all the things that he cared about, I invest in them too. Because he just, just because he just took the chance. So I'm never not busy to go down there to the mentoring camp. <laughs> I mean, man, is it, we gonna have fun anyway. So I go down to the mentoring camp and I hang out with those kids and I see them. You know, we don't publicize any of these things that we do. The thing about it is that because he invested in me and I invest in other people. So you may run across people, you be like, they may say to you like, oh my God, Junior invested in you? You, you shouldn't even be shocked. Cause it'd be like, you, you, it's gonna be people running out in this business. I don't, but you're gonna run across people like, oh my God, been doing the same thing. Been doing the exact same thing. Son, I don't, I don't do anything uh, differently than what I'm doing now. You know, I just, I, I mean, so everybody focuses on the position. Mm. We just focus on the work. So Harvey said something to me one time. He was like, he asked me a question. This is, this is when I first started working. I probably had been working for Harvey Fame about six months. And we're sitting in the studio in Atlanta. And he says, hey, man, why are you doing this? And I probably, he probably remembers coming back, But he was generally asking me a question because he was trying to figure out what my intent was. I said, man, I just love making people laugh. Man. He said, hey, man, that's all good. Why are you doing this? The focus was he was trying to get me to say because I want to build a better life for my family. And I was just over here, just dedicated to the fact that you gave me a job, you gave me an opportunity. No, 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 that's the name of the focus is. See, the focus ain't to be famous. The focus is to build a better life for your family. Which spoke to why he does everything he does. And why he does it. Why he does it. I was so caught up on, hey man, I was so glad to have a job. He's like, no, 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 you're missing the point. And he taught me that about five months as I started working on that the focus is to build a better life for your family. And that's for any man. That's for anybody working, I don't care what you do. Don't get caught up in the fame of the position, which was the lesson he taught me within the first three months of working for him. We're not doing this for fame, though. We're doing this to build a better life for our families. Any hardworking man or woman wants to build a better life. And so I was young at that point. I didn't understand what he was saying. I was 33 years old. I had no clue. But now that I'm 42, I can sit there and say, I get it. I know why I do the work. I know why I get up in the mornings. I know what the why is. It's to build a better life for my family. That's the enjoyment we get out of what we do. You ain't doing this, Don, on this podcast and talking to all these people just because Don want to talk. You're building a better life for your family. That's what we're doing. Yeah, I was telling Carla that. And she's like, you know, Dawn, you know, take it easy. I do think there's a level of balance. But I was like, Carla, there's so much I want to see. And just like that thing that you talked about, that voice, that saying there is more to travel the world, to have these experiences. And the plus is that I get to inspire people. Like, come on. How, how, how dope is your purpose when it gives to other people? Stop playing with me. No, I totally get it. I, I, I mean, I can sit up and say, man, sometimes they get in the quiet moments when I wake up like, on a Saturday or I sit there and say, I'm just like, yo, for real, for real, for real, dog. let's just admit. Let's just all just admit. You got a dope ass life, dude. Wow. I'll be sitting back and say, yeah, yeah, this is pretty dope. <laughs> That's, I mean, just to be honest, in those quiet moments, you have to take that in. But you guess what, though? At least recognize the journey that you've been on and how far you've come. At least recognize that. Every now and then it's okay to say, hey, golly, look how far we come. I don't care who you are as a person. I don't care if you used to work on fries and own the McDonald's. Just look at the journey. Man, it's okay to look back at that. Man, 
Look how far we come. It used to be the mechanic and you own the dealership. What you say? Man. Used to be the janitor and now you own the building. Man, it's okay to look back and say, golly. Man, I had a pretty dope life because the process, the process is what you look forward to. The process is what you are um, um, smiling about. The process of you getting from point A to point B. And then you ain't even through. Ain't even through. Yeah, you, you're just looking at the process because one thing you do, the one thing you do, you do it. But guess what? Everything that got you from point to point to B, keep replicating it, and you'll be, you'll never, never. See, it, once you got the, the, the form for success, which is very simple. What's that? The form for success is that keep doing the same thing you've been doing. You got to keep doing, you have to keep, the, see, <laughs> the success part, I'll tell you when I knew I was successful. This is when I knew I was successful. I was very successful way before I realized before the morning show. I was already successful. Because I had done some things I didn't realize. Give it to me. What you do? You know what I'm saying? It, did, it didn't take me being on the Steve Harvey morning show for me to be already a successful I person. See, I hear you. I hear you. I was already successful. In my mind, I kept chasing something. Because guess what? I look back over a long period of time, all them driving in the rest stops for 75. You was already successful because you were producing something that most people could not produce. A check and sacrificing at the same time. It didn't take me getting to the CR Morning Show to say, you successful. I had to realize that I had already been successful in 2006. Because my work ethic and my attitude was already in the successful position. Mm. What I had manifested was the dollars. That was it. I already had the work ethic that what Steve came around and manifested for me was the dollars. But I didn't owe anybody, uh, 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 I didn't owe anybody a seat at the table. I had to come to the table and say, Woo, shoo, I'm so glad I'm here. Steve Harvey Morning Show, I'm successful. Uh-uh, no, no, no. I had already been successful because I sacrificed already to get to this position. And is it everything that you thought it would be? Yeah, I had already done everything. What I learned from being on the morning show was it don't stop here. There's more. Mm. You, know, you know, you know, it's funny, Don. This, this, and it's just one of those things where you just sit back and laugh. It's one of those things just, just in your grave. It's funny to land in Chicago and hear your voice on the radio. <laughs> It's funny to go to New York and you and then you in the car and you hear it. It's like <laughs> like like for it is to go to DC and hear your voice on the radio for a commercial. You know what I mean? Like I I'm on here for it. Like I'm I literally am across the country. Yes. All because of one dude, but all the commercials I've been cutting, it's funny to go to Birmingham. Or to go to Shreveport or to Montgomery or Detroit. <laughs> you Detroit. You get it mix 92.3, all of that. You get in the car and close the door. And then, hey everybody, you say, I'll be like, that is me. That's that boy Junior. That all across. It's just one of those highs. I'd be like, I'd be laughing. I'd be like, oh my gosh. To the point to where I go to Atlanta, turn the radio. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Savannah, uh, Charlotte, Jackson, Nashville, Memphis. Pick a city, we ain't on it. <laughs> just think about it. <laughs> just and, it. and you get in the car, you got the airport, and they listening, and you be like, that's me. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> so, that's me. Oh, you get in, you get a car, you hit the morning show, and it, it's just like one of those things like, at one point in time, that was not even possible. Mm-hmm. So now you get to enjoy it to the point where, like, you're not, you, you just be like, I just be laughing. I've been, I've been in the backseat of Ubers and in the crowd, be like, ah! <laughs> you be like, what is so funny? And he don't know. That's me. <laughs> he ain't got no clue. That's me. 
you know, they, they don't even know that part, you know. Mm. And you get to you get to experience uh, all of those euphorias to say, hey man, hey man, no matter what happens after this point, gone. Somebody after I'm long gone going to say, I remember when, and they're going to say my name. Hello? And here's the thing, too. You've talked about your journey. You've talked about the successes. And even with the recent passing with Chadwick Bozeman, you realize that this brother was battling stage three cancer for the past four years of his life to highlight. Because I thought about Chadwick because, and it's so crazy, I put it on my, on, on my pages, but even when he was battling those things, when he came on Uncle Steve's talk show, I went down there and, and, and met him and talked to him. And I went down there as a fan and really getting a friend. He was, you know, the crazy part about, like, it's so crazy about, but like, he enjoyed his craft, right? He enjoyed the acting part. You could see it in his work, but when you see the person, and you meet him as a person, he was so humbly. I was like, dude, you Black Panther, he, what is you bowing to me for like, oh, dog, what is you doing? Like, man, I came out here to meet you. And he would open up, he'd be like, man, he was glad to meet you. He was that open. And he was that caring. And I just remember all the conversations we had, the, the three times we met, the conversations we was having, and just all I can remember is the laughing. Like we laughed so hard. I was like, hey man, somebody come get Chad. Chad crazy. Chad was that ignorant. He was that funny. As a person though. But he was there to promote a gift he was giving the world. Mm-hmm. It was a movie or whatever it was. But but you know, he was sharing his, his art and you know, giving somebody a mode to escape. And I feel like that's why it's so important the job that you do, because on any any given night, you could be saving countless of lives. Somebody that said, Oh, it's over, you didn't put a smile on their face, talking about your family, something that you've experienced, laughing at your pain. And it's right. something that I even think about because you look at Chadwick like you're saying, here he is humble. You don't even know this brother is experiencing a fight. And I think about, you're talking about the fact of how you lost your best friend. How you on the road trying to make it work? My God, come into the realization that you are in the room and S Steve Harvey is saying, I'm taking a liking to you. Dealing with those pressures on top of the fact that you battle with sickle cell. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that because you have a foundation and I don't know, the first time I ever heard about sickle cell when I was a kid was probably li uh, listening to TLC and t Boz would always talk about her battle, but I'm not sure people really understand what it is. Uh, a good friend of mine, because she has single cell as well. Uh, we were in a play together a long time ago. But the... I focus more on... And, and this does just not go for every single cell warrior. This does not go for all of us. You know... It's, it's just the way the carpet's rolled out. It's just the cards you dealt, okay? So, I was born with sickle cell, and the parents didn't know what was wrong with me. I wasn't diagnosed until I was eight years old, seven years old. And so, they said, yes, your son has sickle cell, and your parents don't understand what wait, what was going on with you? Well, I was in the, in the pain crisis, and, you know... They thought it was allergic to milk, uh, oatmeal, all kinds of stuff. So you couldn't walk? Your head was hurting? Yeah, couldn't walk. He was in pain. He just couldn't touch me. None of that. Oh. So all these different things were going on. And, you know, you got a kid that's been doing it since he was born. You know, when I was five, I was Coca-Cola, all this type of stuff. So all these different things are happening. And then and a doctor diagnoses you at seven years old, well, the reason why you don't don't understand because your son has sickle cell. There's not a lot going on. And then the doctor turned around to your parents and said, hey, well, prepare for him to die at 11. Whoa, stop it. 11? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. My, every kid was, you, it's funny because we all make fun of it, but every kid was sickle cell. You ask like, hey, this is like a running joke in the, in the sickle cell. Be like, hey, what was your death date? They say 12, 9, 3, 4. Everybody got one. Mine was 11. 
So my parents allowed me to go out and do everything I wanted to do because at one point in time, they would believe that I was going to be gone at 11. So I turned 11 and in heaven. So they're like 12 and like, this the year. <laughs> I, I mean, I was, I'll tell you the truth. Like, they were really somber. Like, everybody tiptoeing around you, like, we have to be nice because we played them this year. Turn 13. Okay, everybody, <laughs> hold on. My mom, mom, I want to go to Disney World. We're going, son. <laughs> we're going to Disney World, son, because they think they mind. You're not going to be. You made everybody tiptoeing around you. Right. But I'm sure you got a lot what you wanted. Oh, I'm just saying, I didn't know that they were doing it at the time. I just looked back on it. I know why they were doing it. Because she was telling me, like, we were doing all these different things. Because we expected you to die. The doctor said it the whole night. Everybody knows at 11, you're not going to be here. Because a doctor said it. That's the whole thing. A doctor said it. It wasn't something I said. The doctor said, hey, man. Your son will not live past 11. Well, I made 11 my football number, my basketball number. Wherever that doctor at right now, he is right now 31 years behind. He is not a Wow. Guy. You know, 11 is a special number of mine. When he said that, it, it enabled everybody to act a certain way towards you because 15, can you imagine that 15, I'm talking about, they speaking like, are you okay? <laughs> How you feeling? Yeah, uh, I'm good. What's what's going on? They just expecting you to die. Now, did you ever catch any wind or know how sick you were? No, no, no. I, I mean, I had the crisis. I had everything. I had all that, all those problems, those issues. But nothing was to death. But then, too, at the same time, sickle cell is a very hard disease that people have to deal with. It's not a lot of information on it, but at the same time, it's very hard to deal with because there's no words to explain the type of pain that they go through. I can't tell you. So if you say, what's it like to be in sickle cell crisis? I can't give you that. Mm. Well, I have to take my sickle cell and give it to you. Then you get back to and say, um, that's enough. Then you'd be like, okay, I have an idea. I can't tell you how these people survive these things. But one thing about it is it builds the character of little things that you may take in for, for granted in mm -hmm. your life and little things. Uh, we don't really even look at those as problems. Right. It's funny because it's just how it is. Like, you know, oh my God, they're going to turn my lights off. Turn them off. Because fighting for your life is way harder. What you say? Life. Come on. See, people don't know. I've almost died seven times. What? I've died. What do you mean? Yeah, I've almost died seven times from sickle cell. I've almost, sickle cell killed me, almost killed me seven times. What do you mean what I mean? You can't grasp that concept because you haven't been there. Why? So you're you looking around to me, what do you mean? No, I mean just what I said. I've almost died seven times. Well, you've never been to the point of death and the brink of death, so what do you mean is a natural response for you? Because you've never been there. Why do you think, Don, I'm always happy all the time? Right. Kira gonna come in with a smile and a joke no why matter what. do you think I always, Why do you think... You think that's on accident? When I'm always like, hey, what's going on? Hey, woo! Hey, how you feeling? That, yeah. Because I've almost died seven times. So my appreciation for life is way more understandable than the man, average person. So you come to me and you say, they cut your lights off. <laughs> I said, what? Dot, dot. What did they do it on uh, Tuesday? Well, damn it, I damn it died Tuesday. <laughs> I don't like how you're making me laugh at that. <laughs> But yeah, that's just what it is. Just there's nothing wrong with that, Don. It's just how it is. There is nothing wrong with that. Mm. That's the absolute truth. So while you're talking about I almost that, what? You they cut your lights off. 
that one cut my life off. Mm. Saying that. You got to just, and it just makes you look at things in a whole other perspective. And just like how you were talking about losing Brian, you you gained something. The the fact that you were just sitting there, you didn't know if your lights were going to be off on your life. Right. And why it's so but precious thing, every moment. The thing about, I'm doing all of this with no life insurance, no, no health insurance. So there are probably times on the road that you aching in pain on stage and performing. Single star crisis got to be on uh, with no health insurance. So when I say, morning, everybody, believe me, I mean, morning, everybody. <laughs> I was doing all of that. Not even, can't even, I got sick. Sickle cell crisis didn't stop because I started telling jokes around the country. It didn't stop. None of that. All of that happened the way it happened. My attitude towards that happen the way it happened but in the end see the other reason why I'm so grateful for Mr. Hardy is because I got a health insurance plan come on oh I can't wait to get sick I'll be, er- I'll be early <laughs> oh I'll be up there oh I'll be in the I'll be in the emergency room waiting for it I'll be there early I can just be rotating yeah you're like where's you at yeah I got sick don't worry about it I'll be back though because they gonna get me right back because I got health insurance Oh, I want a good bed. I want. I be in there picking. I be in that bed shopping. Hot down. I need the extra comforter. Can I please have my breakfast at eight a.m.? Is room three open? I want to get room three, please. They got the ice machine right there. Oh, I be. There. Oh, I be different. I be way. I be way different. So your foundation, Cures Hope, is all about, you know, just spreading awareness from it, right? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people that you know may not have know where the resources are. No, no, no. It is. Um, my foundation started back in 2014. It was uh, done out of a uh, friend of mine pushing me and said, hey, man, you have to start a foundation. You have to do this. You have to show other people how to live with sickle cell because as hard as it is, and a lot of it, a lot of it is um, mental. Mm. Sickle cell is a mental game that you have to play with your own life. You know, I mean, the, the hard part about it is that I know that I process things a lot differently than people with no health conditions. They just, you know, they go around and take life for granted. See, my, my wake, when I wake up in the morning, I do this. I go to the window and I do this. Mm-hmm. My hand on the window. Because weather plays a, 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 a big factor. So I check temperatures. I watch, I watch the weather channels and What's the tune of where I'm going if I'm traveling? Because cold weather is not good for us with citizens. Oh. You know, cold weather constricts your veins. The veins and the blood cells, the way they're shaped and everything, they can get, get a blockage. I can have a sickle crisis if it's 30 degrees outside, 50 degrees outside, 60 degrees outside. If it's hot, I'm good. See, you go swimming in the afternoon if you want to. You can go just jump in the pool swimming. I ain't been swimming in afternoons in years. I've never done. I ain't jumped in a pool at five o'clock since I was about 12. Wow. Oh, but if it's 12 o'clock high noon, I'm in there because the water's hot. See, those are things that people don't even have to worry about. Going to the beach. Oh, five o'clock. In there, you can go run off and just get in the ocean. People are sick of stuff. Oh, we ain't going out there. Huh. So what's the minute that your temperature gets, you know, it, it hurts. Immediately. You ask me if I'm going to Chicago in February. You think I'm going? Nope. Nope. So guess what? I don't book a show in February in Chicago. That's how much sickle cell has a way on my life. I can't go to Chicago in February. I go to Chicago in June, July. But I ain't going in March. I ain't going in February. I ain't going in January. See, those are things you don't even have to worry about. See how you look at those are things you don't even have to worry. You don't even have to consider these things. No. That's not something to consider. Yeah, people with single cell consider these things all the time. You know, my foundation, I, I do a great job of raising awareness and I put a lot of money into it and we do all the different things, but the families that I meet, they understand that I'm saying it's like I know I help these families in June in, in December. For Christmas and everything, because most kids during the holidays with sickle cell are in the hospital. 
Oh. So I give them a Christmas before they go into the hospital. So that's what the foundation does. I sit there, I talk to all these families. I take 10 families every year around the holidays, not by the entire Christmas. 10 families. Wow, Q, that's amazing. I've been doing that for the last six years. Cures Hope Foundation. Wow. I go to, um, I've done it in Austin. I've done it in Memphis. I've done it in Dallas. I've done it in Atlanta. I've done it in Charlotte. I've done it in D.C. I've done it in Jacksonville. I, I just, don't matter. I just go. So what's the plan for the foundation this year? I haven't picked the city yet. I haven't picked the city yet. I've done Chicago. I haven't picked the city yet this year. Um, normally, my director, my foundation, Rosalind, she does the picking of the cities. It doesn't matter. It's not my job to pick cities because I ain't got time to do it. Just right. where we going. She goes and researches all the needs, all these different things, and we do it. But I do that every year. And you think about where we are with the morning show that Harvey just told me, he said, dog, you can't get to the top of the mountain and not reach back and show them how to get up there. Wow, yeah. So that's how I started the foundation. You know, my foundation is six years strong. I'm proud of it. My walk is on September 19th. Yes, the run, the 5K yeah. run and fun walk. In Dallas, you know. In how Dallas, do people Texas. check it out or register? Oh, it's CuriousHope.org. K-I-E-R-S hope.org. And this will be my third year. Um, a lot of people don't know that in the state of Texas that every month of June is a national holiday for my foundation in the state of Texas every June. Cures Hope Month. Cures Hope. Um, Cures Hope Sickle Cell Awareness Month is every June in the state of Texas. Wow, kid, that's amazing. to Orange, Texas every month. Hey, 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 I got all the awards on the wall, everything. I mean, you know, it's funny, man, to to see that type of thing. Royce West helped that make possible. Senator Royce West, State Senator Royce West, and Tate made that, made that possible. I mean, man, but could you believe one guy out of Houston, Texas would do all of these different things? But that was that one guy with a big dream. Man, it was one dude. Who had a why. I mean, sometimes I just sit back and pinch myself because I'm still the same guy, man. I, I love it. But at the same time, like, I look at some stuff like, you know, like, I have, you know, like, I'm an Emmy-nominated producer. I didn't win the Emmy. So I was nominated for People that got their whole career never for? been nominated. I mean, just the invitation alone to the Emmys. Because you I'm did, the, you Steve. Yeah, I'm the same dude out of Houston, Texas. That's the same, that same damn dude. Same OG. I mean, let's, be, let's just be for real. Like, come on now. Like, dude, you got to be tripping on some of these stuff, man. Do you sit back and then you go out on the weekends and then you pull up to the comedy club and your name is on the marquee. And then you <laughs> then you come on and say, morning, everybody. Then you talk about it. It's, so let me ask you this. When did, okay, so you know how like singers are performer, right? And you know how like you said, oh, when I'm in the car and I hear myself on the radio. <laughs> when was the first time, like, where were you? Where were you at? Did you realize like, quote unquote, I made it? Even though you were already successful in the mindset, but was it like you saw yourself at the Fox Theater? You, did you see yourself, you know, where was it? And it could be a small time, but you was like, dang, it was I did. In Dallas. It was in Dallas, Texas. It was the first time I saw my name on the top of the marquee that like, I'm selling tickets. <laughs> I'm so people are paying <laughs> it's great because people are paying $25 a ticket to hear me come tell jokes and then I walked out that comedy club that weekend what about I did Thursday Friday Saturday and I walked out there with about 17.5 are you that's when I knew something because my whole <laughs> I was like there's no way you understand? I ain't never made seventeen five. Hold nothing. on, wait a minute. How old are you right now at this point? At that point, I was thirty five. God, dog. God, what? But I'm, I'm telling you, that's what it was. I mean, that's when I knew. I said, okay. I don't know if I had made it, but I knew. I said, we're definitely in the right Do neighborhood. <laughs> I don't Everybody know. know my and, then, and then Harvey was talking about that. He said, "Dog, you stop. You, you." He was telling you that you have no idea 
what you're about to go be doing. Wow. So the improv in Dallas called me and they said they want me to come headline their club that weekend. <sighs> I ain't have no manager and that. They just say, hey, we're going to offer you uh, this much money and then if you sell this many tickets, we're going to give you this and then bonuses and all this type of stuff. So I ain't never heard none of this. I was just glad to go to Dallas and just do the show. Yeah, okay. I, I had no idea. You know, I'm junior. Yeah, all right. I'll be there. Let's do it. Hot, everything. Ready? Whole nine. But then on that Sunday, when we sold up with the club, they gave me a, they gave me 10,000 cash. Oh. They gave me 7,500 in a check. I said... <laughs> No, no, for it, dumb. Like I was in time, I got up, I, st- I walked around, I turned around, I said, oh. <laughs> And I was hoping they was going to say, like, we made a mistake. Because I'm sitting here, you got to say, there's 10,000 cash here. Then you got to check. This got to be a mistake. Where, this got to be a mistake. I got 10K here. 7,500 in a check. So this is seventeen thousand five hundred dollars. Don't feel let me walk out of here. And if you never made that much money before, that's your natural reaction. I ain't never made no seventeen five and no one weekend. In a weekend, that's half I, of somebody's salary in a year. Hey, I don't know what it is. All I know was <laughs> I need to know, know, know if I'm walking out of here. Because this feel like a setup. I took my time leaving Don. I said this got to be see this is how they get set up on first forty eight. There's a steam operation going on. They want to say, walk out of here. Something. Oh. <laughs> now I gotta get back on the plane, go back to Atlanta. But I'm getting back on a plane with 10K cash. And then you, know, you all these thought you can't fly more than ten thousand dollars in your pocket. All these things. I got a check. I got the receipt. Got the whole nine. So I got a book bag. <laughs> so I got my book bag. I got. I've never held my book bag tighter than I got. I got this whole book bag. On my, when I put it through that damn um, X-ray machine, I waited for that bag to come out. I got ten k in here. Man, that bag made them say, I said, Oh, they're gonna stop me because they're gonna see the they're gonna see the money on, on the x-ray. Man, that bag, <laughs> that TSA agent was trying to talk to me. I ain't hear nothing there. Right. <laughs> Give him the bag. Thank you, be careful. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. <laughs> I'm on I'm on the two o'clock. Right. I got back home. And Harvey tell you, it's very funny. Charlie tell you. He said, Man, that was the funny thing because I called him. I said, uh. I had made. And he was like, yeah, dog. Yeah, yeah. Th- that's what you're supposed to make. Yeah. And that's when I knew that my life was completely different. Oh, I had made a, a couple grand for a weekend or three grand. I did that. I ain't never went from five grand to 17.5. My first weekend telling jokes as a headline, I didn't even know. And once I saw that, I said, okay, I don't know if I ride, I just know we in the right neighborhood. I'm in the right neighborhood. And that's how it started. And from there, it was funny. Well, so now that, that you've accomplished all this, what's next? Movies. We got your movies. I want to do movies. You working on anything right now? Any scripts? Uh, no, we in COVID. Ain't nothing happening. <laughs> As soon as it's over, then we'll work on it, you know. We'll get there. It, it just takes time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, um, I've done a lot of plays, stuff like that, but I really like to solidify myself on a film. Just see what I could do. Just just one of the things I'm, I'm doing. I mean, it just, so what I want to do. I want to do acting on I acted in plays. I've done that. And a lot of people remember all them plays. I have Dave Jacaris Johnson plays and you know, um, I just want now. I want the next step. I want to graduate. I just want to do. It. I just want. Just I just want to go through the process. So wait, wait, a- just because I gotta, I gotta support my Wakanda quote unquote tattoo that I got before Black Panther came out about yeah. speaking life. So that's all about the affirmations. Yeah. So you will have this movie. Is it an action movie? Is it a comedic movie? What is this movie that you're doing? 
I think the movie I would do was I would like to play opposite someone and I want to be a regular day in the neighborhood type of film. Like, how eating we act in the neighborhood. <laughs> and I just want to just, you know, bring up some of the events that we've done and you know, things I've done, been a part of, and just put those on film and, you know, just make that funny. And then work with some of the greatest people that you can work with who, who are great at these roles. You know what I'm saying? I want to do, I want to do that part. I really want to do that part because for one, I want to just, see, once you put your stuff on film, you're going to live forever. Last forever. <laughs> it's going to last forever. So I want to do that part. That's the main reason why I want to do it. But whatever film it comes, an uh, action comedy, uh, uh, a movie like Friday or anything like that, that I'm, I'm going to do all of them. You know, I want to do all of them because I just think that, you know, I ain't really mad about it, but I said, like, okay, y'all playing me short. You're playing me short. Just open up the, the camera and let me get on here because I'm going to show you the biggest fool that I am. <laughs> I am not and that's all the let, let, let me be let me be unfit. let me just put this out here. All the movies I'm doing, I'm not going for Oscars. <laughs> just so we're clear, let's not get any expectations this no, is. Look at that. All these movies I'm doing is going for this boy goddamn food. That's what the food, that's what the that's what I'm, my roles I'm doing. This boy crazy. This boy damn food. That's the rules I'm going for. I'm not going for father. I don't, none of these roles. I don't want none of them. Father, look at me. Look at me, Father. I'm, I'm not the one on Oscars. I want to be in the roles of this boy crazy. This boy got proud. Hey, there's something wrong with him. A bona fide fool. Yeah, that's all I want to be. I want all my roles. That's all I want to do. Because I believe in the magic of storytelling. Just want I just want. Um, that's what you do that all day. Yeah, every all joke, around. every script you write in. Yeah, these movies that I do, these jokes I tell, turn them into movies. You know, turn them into to, to projects. I, I was dying laughing. You were on the stage. I don't know if you was talking about when you dating somebody that snores. <laughs> Candy oh, yes. yeah, 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 I yeah, died. Yeah. I would love to see that. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be, you know. This and one, every this time it was a snore, it was a thought of a piece of food. That yeah. was dope. Yeah. This, th- those type of moments, though. Yeah. That's the, those type of moments are the ones we want to bring um, to the to the best friend. We, we want to do those moments. We, we want to tell those stories. As crazy as they are, there are stories to be told behind all those things. So mm-hmm. absolutely, I get it. So you appreciate it for that? That's for sure. That I, I mean, can you you uh, you know, I don't know what I expected from this conversation, but I'll say this: that I came out a better person. Just I never knew your story like that. I didn't know the things that meant to you. I didn't realize how Harvey invested in you like that, of just giving that opportunity. And now it makes sense. And then this whole thing that you said, and I think a lot of people got to realize, it's the whole thing that the birds of a feather flock together. And when you kept, you riding with people that own fire, it's only a matter of time when you're going to get lit. But like That's you it. said, it's about the work and not the position. It's not that. I'm absolutely, I believe that wholeheartedly. You know, we don't get in this to be famous. We can't do the work. Um, I'll show you this. I'm going to show you this. This is what I'm going to show you, and then we can close it with this. But this is, if you think, if you think. And this is perfect, because I was going to ask you, if there is a quote or anything that you can leave people with, what would it be? Um, I'm going to show you. This is it. My life and health, my fam- my gratitude for God, my life and health, my family, for my relationship. We went fast. Grateful for the people. Thank you for the abundance. Oh, is- amen. You praise them in advance. See, this is it. Wow, Lord, I love you. God, that's I my- will. See, that's, my, that's what I read every morning. And a lot of things on that list has come to pass. So whatever you, whatever your assumption is about me, I have no, I take no part in that part. But he know exactly who his steward is, what he's given me, how I do it. I can't take criticism from anybody who ain't doing nothing. 
I cannot take criticism. I'm sorry. Whatever your opinion is about me, but what are you doing? But see, I just showed you my entire gratitude list for God that I keep adding to my health, my life, my grandma. All the things that we sat here and talked about, some of them has passed, some of them things have not passed. Still grateful for them, though. Some things I'm just wishing. That's the difference of what you think you know about me and what you don't know. I ain't here, I ain't here to impress you. Who are you? Who are you, who are you thinking I deserve you deserve my attention? I ain't here for you. See, you wasn't nowhere near when I was sleeping in the rest stops. See, you wasn't you wasn't nowhere around. When I was trying to get $75, you wasn't nowhere around. I'm not impressed with any of that. I've heard everything. What you think? I ain't heard everything? I've heard everything. I've heard it all. I've heard everything with how they say about me, what they feel about me. From colleagues to family to friends, you can't disturb what I'm doing. I just showed you. This is my gratitude for God. That, and guess what? Why, why you keep talking all that? Can't you see publicly how he keep blessing me what in spite you of what say? you say? And you know what I've realized? I don't know the, the exact Bible verse, but it gives me to the thing of how your enemies will be your footstool. Not because I'm going to stump on you. It's because no. I am obedient. You will have no other choice but to uplift me. So no. I don't have to worry about raining down on you. It don't matter what you... So let's get off the... the it, it'll do you... It'll serve you better. <laughs> it'll serve you better to quit talking about me, man. Oh. I'm, I'm already good about who I am, man. They, they already know. And, and and as I say this, and they probably gonna see it on social media all the time, so they know, but they know exactly who I'm talking to. They they ain't got... Dog, you. I don't know when y'all gonna realize that this dude... Ain't for y'all. I don't need your round of applause. I don't need a, I don't need a clap from you. I just need the people to clap for me so I can keep doing what I'm doing. That's right. I don't do this for you, dude. We're in the same business. One surgeon don't watch another surgeon do surgery. Because what, what you say? The focus. Yeah, the focus. Where we at? So, uh, yeah. So, they, you know, they probably look and say, like, I don't know. They say these things about me. I get it. No, I'm cool. But you see the public blessing he keep putting. Now, you have never stopped to ask yourself, how come that keep happening? And that's the magic of leadership. That's the magic of being in the right place at the right time. And that's the magic of being focused on one mission. I never asked God to be famous. I just told him to ask me, give me the gift that I have. Let me give it back to you so you can bless it so I can change lives through laughter. That's it. And, and look what happened. Ta-da. Care Junior Spates, ladies and gentlemen. That's what happened. <laughs> Ta-da. Wow. Good, Don. I enjoyed so, this. I, I enjoy. Thank you. Let me thank you. I know you talked about I'm going to be all mushy, but thank you for pouring into me because you spoke on so many ways of just the transition, just my grind. Like, I don't know what's about to happen. I'm just going because I know what I feel. And I'm just on a prayer that whatever happens, it's going to work out. It has to, right? It ain't no other option, man. Come on. And that's what I try to tell you. been there. Don't care what they say. <sighs> Stay doing done. Girl, do you know, you have no idea. You can't have, there ain't no way it's not going to have you done. The, the, way you, the way you do things, the way you operate, the person you are, the light you shine. Do you know how hard it is to be positive every day? Do you know how hard it is? Of course I know. You positive every day. And even when it's not well received, you got to show up again and do it again the next day. And even when they don't receive it that day, you show up a third day. Done. You have to continue doing that. Guess what? It ain't about what they're doing. So, so what? They don't see it. It's not for them. Come on. You're not doing all of this to impress anybody. You're doing this to expose people about what do positive people have to say. Yes. And why it's right. important. 
oh, well, Don got this thing. This ain't your thing. That's where they lose at. It's not even about what you're doing. It's about what you're showcasing. And if you can't see what Don is showcasing, you got to add to it that you're not going to benefit from, from the first place because your attitude in the wrong place. But for you and Ian to get all this stuff together, that take work. That take a, a schedule. You got to coordinate with people. But don't allow anybody to tell you what your mission is. That ain't for them to dictate. If I got time to sit up and judge Don about what she doing, I must not have nothing to do. Right. <laughs> I clearly don't have nothing to do. You got to be thinking that. You got to be doing something if you got somebody right. else's attention. Come on, Don. If, you, if I have time to sit up here and talk about what Don doing, I must not be doing nothing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You just called me and said, you going to do this for me? Yeah, yeah I'll do this for Don. The, the, the phone call about two minutes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that did it for you. That's it. Thank you. Oh my gosh, Kier, like okay, so this is what happened. You called me, you said, Dawn, you met me. The first time I met you, you kept saying how it was wonderful and how it was amazing. Yeah. Listen, it didn't take me three and a half, almost four years to see that because look at us no. right now. I you know. can't tell me because I knew. Me? I knew I felt it. And when you yeah. got somebody that's talking to Brian, I felt it. And like you said, being human. So Kier, thank you. Thank you for oh. investing in yourself. Thank you for feeling like you're worth it. And thank you for being a beacon of light that inspiring other people. I see you and we I see you. Do my best, love. Do Man, best. that's what vitamin D is about. That's it. Uh, vitamin <laughs> okay. D, yeah. How do people follow you? How, how can I get you? What's up? Uh, you know, you can find me on social media, Junior, at Junior, S-H-M-S, everything. J-U-N-I-O-R, S-H-M-S. Find me however you find me. Send me a message. Say what's up. I say what's up, man. You know, um, I ain't hard to get at. I ain't, ain't nothing. You know, we just we just gonna keep going. You know. And you know what my cousin Barakti, she always tell me, tell, tell Junior I said hi. Remember we met her at Sandin's Soul yeah. last year. Yeah. So still, yeah, how's she doing? She's doing real good. She's doing good. She's gonna love to hear this. You tell Kira I said hi. So, so, so she she can still love me. All right. <laughs> you know, you know, love me. <laughs> we gonna, is, this, is this the avenue we going in? I'm telling something. Yeah, love me. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Just love me. Take me as go I am. Ahead, go ahead and feel how you feel about me. I like that. <laughs> so send me a message. Call every now and then. See what I'm doing. Listen, you know? don't let me have her hold you today because she's talking. You know, what she going to do? <laughs> but you can't get nothing being silent. Oh, vitamin D. Oh, no, I love myself. <laughs> Kid, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. You're welcome. You're welcome. Oh man, nah. I don't know what I expected from Kier, but that was everything and more, and it was right on time. And I'm just so grateful that I was here, ready to receive it, and that I can offer it to you. And that's the one thing that's so amazing to me about vitamin D. When I created it, it was all about shedding light to others. And little did I know that I was gonna receive that on the back end as well. And I think that's one of the amazing things about gifts and when you're given and you're walking in your purpose because your purpose not only feeds others, but it in turn feeds you. It's like a cycle. It's, it's, it's this never ending life cycle that continues to pour and fill up, pour and fill up. Now, if you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did with Kier and you're like, hey, I want to keep up with him. You got to follow him on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at Junior SHMS. And if you want to learn more information about his foundation, Kier's Hope, go ahead and check them out online at Kier'sHope.org. Now, I want you to remember life is for the living. If you feel like you're losing everything, remember that trees lose their leaves every year and yet they stand tall and wait for better days to come. Your better days is coming. Peace be still. You know, in the Bible, in the scripture, it says, see, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Well, that's it for your dose of vitamin D. As always, you can catch us where you get your podcasts every Monday for more inspiring conversations and insights. And of course, if you're looking to get even more vitamin D in your life, you can also follow me on all social media at Dawn Day Speaks. That's Dawn, D-A-I, Speaks on all social media. Until next time, always remember, you are your greatest asset.